when I when I got the opportunity to, to do this talk, I, I decided I wanted to talk about how the way we collect data and, and store it um, is affected by you know, power relationships and hierarchy it being tag. Um, and so, and that's a concern that came out of my PhD because I was working on developer-funded data for my PhD, um, and I wanted to uh, address those questions anyway. Um, and so I'll, t I'll briefly, and, and as as you do, you know, I start off with some questions and some theories about that. So I'll briefly go through those, and then I'll do a couple of little case studies um, that go back back to my PhD a bit and then uh, try and wrap up with some thoughts on, on how things might develop in the future. Um, so, recently, issues about the collection and analysis and ma manipulation of very large data sets, um, and very large and complex data sets, the, the big data revolution, have become more and more important in the humanities and the social sciences, as I'm sure we all know. And that's coincided with this fast increase in the availability of data generated by developer-funded fieldwork in archaeology. Um, and that raises questions in my mind and probably other people's minds. Um, firstly, how much impact have these two developments had on the practice as opposed to the academic visibility of developer-funded archaeology? And then secondly, within that, how much attention within that big data revolution has been given to legacy artefact data and environmental data? Um, I think you could argue for both of those things, not that much. Um, and, and this is often thought to be down to a lack of widely shared data standards, so shared dig digital ontologies um, and appropriate digital infrastructure. Um, however, on the other side, archaeological data sets are characterful, meaning they have histories um, which are important for understanding them and also important in themselves. Um, and which allow us to do characterful research. And here I'm referring to a paper by some colleagues of mine, uh, Chris Green and Amarin Cooper, in them. It was published in, uh, not Archaeological Dialogues, the other one, um, Arc Method and Theory, uh, in 2015. So rather than focusing solely on improving data schema and infrastructure, which are important aims, um, should we be paying more attention to the characterfulness of our data and developing theoretical and methodological tools um, which, which can help to address that character and the issues of power that are bound up in creating it. Um, so there's a technical literature on, on digital ontologies, uh, data standards, and this is driving moves to standardise data in order to facilitate big data research. And that literature has subjected the quality of our political digital data to critique, basically saying that the variability of the way in which we record our data is a huge barrier to research and to the realisation of big data in archaeology, big data in quotes. Um, papers uh, to look at on this are, I'm going to now say the name of someone, I don't know how to pronounce their name, K-I-N-T-I-G-H, Kintig. Um, very interesting papers in 2006-2018 on um, big data and, and, and the, the, da the TDAR, the Digital Archaeological Resource, the American equivalent of ADS. Um, so large databases, some of them open access, some not. They've been constructed using very flexible ontologies, um, enabling different researchers to share their data on a single platform. good example is, is TDAR, so you can upload your zoarchaeological data, um, uh, tailor it, create your own ontology and upload it so anyone can use it. There's also a parallel literature to this technical literature which is derived from science and technology studies, um, which critiques the, con the, whole, the whole idea of an enforceable set of data standards. Um, but I think you can argue there's an overlap between these two literatures, these two discourses, um, and that focuses around the concept of the boundary object. Now, that's an idea developed in, social, in science and technology studies by Susan Lee Starr and uh, Graham Bowker, um, and it's picked up on by Andrew Jones initially in archaeology and, and Cooper and Green. And I'm, I think it's arguably operationalised tacitly in some of these more big, flexible databases. Um, so what's a boundary object? Um, Boker and Starr define this in their book... Um, getting myself... 
sorting things out, classification and its consequences. It's a really wonderful book. Um, and they define a boundary object as an object for cooperation um, or classification which spans more than one community of practice and satisfies the informational requirements of each of them. Um, so their example would be something in, say, medical science, where you need to classify a particular kind of pathology and you disseminate a series of codes for your database um, so that you can uh, all know what you're talking about. Uh, and that generates its own problems. Um, but importantly, the creation of these data, data schema and the modification is also about the creation and subversion of power relations. And the, bound, the idea of boundary objects, which I'll come back to, highlights this. Um, and within these debates on digital standards, um, I, I think artifacts and environment and environmental data have been relatively neglected, even though they arguably face greater problems of variation. Um, zoo archaeology is, it fares a bit better. There's more agreement among specialists about how to classify um, animal bones. Um, but it's still possible to come up with some really um, widely varying results from different researchers. So there was an article by Atiki et al. 2013 where the same zoological data set was given to three different researchers to process without talking to each other and they came up with um, three sets of different age of death profiles just by counting the data in a different way, the same data. Um, so there's also moves now to, to think about this in, um, in ceramics. There's a series of papers in internet archaeology last year, um, which I shouldn't ignore. Um, but I think the debate on digital standards that's emerged <coughs> over the course of the last decade um, has, in general, uh, with a few exceptions, not been widely engaged by fine specialists. And it's not also widely engaged with this um, discourse on um, science and technology studies or from science and technology studies. Um, and then, in parallel to this debate um, on standards and ontologies, we have the um, development of the of the big data projects in archaeology using the massed data of developer funded archaeology. Um, so, starting off with Richard Bradley's um, prehistory of Britain and Ireland, the Fields of Britannia project at Exeter, the Roman Rural Settlement project um, at Reading, and the English Landscapes and Identities projects, and they were all primarily concerned with landscapes and monuments, although they all also paid some attention to uh, artefacts and ecofacts, um, but mostly developed in isolation from these debates on digital infrastructure. Um, very few devoted, devoted a lot of space in their publications to um, methodological issues, um, with some honourable exceptions. Um, Cooper and Green again, and, and, and Neil Holbrook and, and Mike Fulford published a paper in the Archaeological Journal recently about the Roman Royal Settlement methodology. Um, and so I think, despite more than a decade of wrestling with these issues um, about the standardisation of data, use of developer-funded data for research, um, we could argue that relatively little progress has been made in developing tools for the exploitation of digital finds uh, in Enviro data. Um, but I'm going to argue that the concept of the boundary object could offer a way forward and go on to argue that different communities of practice that study and produce data on ceramics and animal bone and child plant remains commonly deploy boundary object, objects tacitly and that if you can identify those you can you can use them to deploy a set of loose standards to make a legacy data set into a problem. Um, um, so for example in, in ceramic studies you could equate um, the idea of a boundary object with commonly deployed uh, types of uh, functional vessel classes, so jar, bowl, cup, flagon, etc. Common to different sub-disciplines of um, pottery studies. So, if you think of prehistoric pottery, Roman pottery, medieval pottery as sub-disciplines, um, but also tailored by different researchers with the addition of a range of more specific type codes. So, you know, you get your jar type. 7A or 3WB or whatever it is. Um, in archaeozoology, the boundary object is arguably more prevalent. Um, classifications of genera and species, common terms for bones and pathologies. Um, in archaeobotany, 
they exist at the level of species and subspecies. So, for example, emma wheat could be a banjo object. Um, but you get you tend to get a more tailored approach within within species. So you can get a really wide way of classifying different kinds of um, six and two row barley, as I recall from uh, Mark Robinson and various other people. Um, several of the big data projects that we that I've just mentioned do use these kinds of uh, categories to classify their data. Um, so now I'm going to try and make this all seem a bit more real for you by moving on to a case study, um, the construction of a, data, a large database using legacy data, which was designed to investigate the histories of food production and consumption, part of the Inglade project at Oxford. Um, and this, I'm going to present this as a, as a case study on the use of boundary objects in the context of ceramic and archaeozoological and archaeobotanical research rather than as a detailed um, kind of recap of my research findings. So, for my PhD, I collected um, legacy data sets from three regions, the Upper Thames Valley, um, 11 sites, Lower Thames Valley, 532 sites, and, and eight, the root of HS1 in Kent, 36 sites. And I had about 2 million shirts of pottery, about half a million animal bones, 20,000 samples, something like that in a transect across England, from west to east, across southern England. And I collected these data sets mainly from um, developer-funded organisations, uh, but also from the ADS, and sometimes from the developer-funded organisations via the Archaeology Data Service. Um, not all of them were complete data sets. Um, in particular, uh, I collected data from the Oracle database of MOLA, and that was um, so huge, I had to be selective. Um, These three case study areas were quite um, varied in terms of geology and settlement record and topography um, and the way they were excavated. I'm going to hurry up. Um, so Upper Thames was kind of homogenous, low-lying and flat, river sands and gravels in the middle Thames, similar to the Upper Thames, but sequences of gravel terraces and London clay and chalk. And HS1, much more topographically and geologically varied. Um, the way they they had been excavated in the upper terms, you tend to get big um, open area excavations, gravel uh, extraction. Um, in the middle terms, quite a lot of um, stuff in London, and also big infrastructure projects like T5, and obviously HS1 is a much more linear transect across the landscape, um, much narrower in comparison, less open area excavations. So uh, these things all affect the kind of data that were collected and therefore the kind of information schemas that were used to organise it. Um, Mostly I've collected digital, le digital um, legacy data uh, and sort of scooped it up straight into, into my database. There was a little bit of um, data entry by hand. Um, and I put all this into a FileMaker database. Um, and a significant part of this for my talk is uh, tables on the, on the left hand diagram labeled concordance tables, which just function to, to translate a huge variety of alphanumeric codes into um, a smaller number of codes for um, purposes of analysis. So about 200 different, 288 different terms for phases um, of later prehistoric Roman, early medieval, into, into 29 different terms. So um, lots of data from different archives, disparate digital ontologies, but, but common boundary objects. So for example, the concept of a phase or standardized date range. Um, and in this way, you can, you can upload huge quantities of legacy data. Um, without the creation of entirely new bespoke digital ontologies. Um, I was able to interrogate the data at different scales um, and at different spatial levels. Um, so the region on the site, um, I'll just get quickly over that and talk a little bit about findings. So I was able to demonstrate um, quite a lot of continuity, um, subtle Subtle, different, subtle differences in emphasis between regions um, in cereals and animals. Um, 
system from the beginning of later prehistory to um, the early medieval period, only really being to change significantly, perhaps in the seventh century. Um, one example was that amongst a um, general pattern of uh, spelt and barley wheat consumption in later prehistory through the Roman period, the HS1 region had a subtle but definite emphasis on emma wheat. Um, and that's something that I think has been, since been backed up by Lisa's research, um, the Roman World Settlement Project. Um, there, was also, there were also interesting unexpected patterns in animal bones, um, an emphasis on sheep goat in the middle of uh, cattle heavy areas on, on along the route of HS1. Um, and in terms of ceramics, a, a kind of variation in complexity from um, heavily bar bowl and jar dominated um, assemblages um, to much more varied assemblages. Um, so starting off in the in prehistory and getting much more uh, complex in the Roman period and then back to jars and bowls and then again much more complex and varied in, in the middle and late Saxon period and but with subtle emphases by regions so a long, um, a long history in the southeast of emphasis on cups across all those periods um, So, in contrast, if you look at uh, developed funded archaeology, um, you tend to get uh, lots of little databases. So data is much more fragmented. Um, they might, databases might be standardised within organisations for project by project basis. Uh, and you see the necessary imposition of data schema, um, which feature concepts that are widely understood across the disciplines, such as stratigraphic concept, context. And others that are tailored to much more local use, for example, a lot of units uh, use concepts like a feature number or a feature label. Um, and that really results in fairly inaccessible data. Um, you could address this by building much more huge, flexible, um, use, more widely usable databases and trying to impose digital standards on people um, that use that data. Um, but this kind of give, this struggles to deal with legacy data um, and also builds in issues of power and control. So the people in control of the standards control what data can be uploaded, what can be shared, um, which seems less than ideal. I'm wrapping up very quickly. Um, so I wanted, having raced through case studies, I wanted to just talk about very briefly about how um, you might bring out the implications of the analysis um, and focus on, on, on the tacit use of boundary objects to structure the data. Um, if you accept the argument that um, subdisciplines of prehistoric ceramics, Roman and medieval ceramics, um, are subdisciplines, um, then, then it can be argued that the data sets that I've just talked about were tacitly constructed around a number of boundary objects um, shared between these different pieces of practice. So they might, these might include the concepts of later prehistory, the Roman period, the early medieval period. They're all chronologically elastic, um, but broadly recognisable to different practitioners. In terms of ceramics, um, they're focused around the idea of type or functional vessel glass, jars, bowls, cups. Um, they allow for immediate commonality of understanding, um, but you can also tweak them and they can proliferate different subtypes. Um, and the presence of these boundary objects essentially allowed me to construct a huge database using data from multiple organisations and that was good at giving um, a clear idea of the big picture at a regional level. Um, I should, I think I want to add that I'm not attempting to argue that the effort to create common standards and in infrastructure should be abandoned, but that effort at agreeing common standards should be focused on the boundary objects while allowing local standards and modifications to flourish. So essentially you should be aware of imposing to rigid standards on our data. Um, I think I was going to talk about what boundary object in archaeology might look like, but I think I might have to skip that um, and just move on to where do we go from here. Um, on the, we have a situation on the one hand where we're trying to develop very tightly defined but widely shared digital ontologies for our data. 
to go alongside centralised online databases such as TDAR and the ADS. And on some level, I mean, that's clearly necessary. But on the other hand, we're still putting the vast majority of our data into small, highly diverse, effectively closed databases. And both these strategies, I think, have the potential to close off rather than open up data to the outside world. Um, on the one hand, they constrain the ways that data is collected. And on the other, they constrain our ability to share it. So to finish up with a question, um, can we, I think my question is, can we, can we propagate the sharing of open standards, which archaeologists of all kinds can adapt to their own characterful data and their own various, varied ways of collecting and processing it? And that's what um, I'm currently thinking about. I don't have an answer to that, but I'd like, like to kind of share that question with you, I suppose. Let me finish up there.